Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. So today I want to take a look at this paper which is absolutely foundational in the field of virtual machines. And if you read many modern papers about virtual machines, you'll see this paper being cited very frequently. And that's because this paper, which was published back in 1974, puts forward a solid definition of what virtualization means. And given an instruction set architecture, what are the necessary conditions for it to be virtualizable? You can tell the era in which this paper was published by the mention of third generation architectures in the title. What this refers to is the shift from transistors to integrated circuits in computer hardware. What this paper eventually builds up to is a very concise and foundational theorem for what conditions an instruction set must satisfy in order to be virtualizable. But in order to build up to that, we have to first go through a lot of definitions. But I promise that it's all going to be worth it. To start with, what is the definition of a virtual machine? The authors define a virtual machine to be an efficient, isolated duplicate of a real machine. And this is with respect to both functionality as well as performance. A program running inside a virtual machine must see an environment that is essentially identical to that of a real machine. And also a program running inside a virtual machine must see at most only a very minor decrease in performance. The only differences between a virtual machine and a real machine that this definition allows are differences in the amount of resources available. So obviously a virtual machine could have less resources available to it than the real machine on which it is running. And also differences that are caused by timing differences. So for example, if your program is dependent on the amount of time it takes to execute a given sequence of instructions, because that might be slightly different in a virtual environment than on the real machine. Another key part of the definition is that execution inside a virtual environment must be efficient and not much slower than that of a real machine. Practically what this means is that even when running inside a virtual machine, the vast majority of the instructions must be directly executed by the real underlying processor. And the third part of the definition, which refers to isolation, means that the virtual machine has complete control of the resources given to the programs running inside it. In other words, a program running inside a VM should not have access to any resource not explicitly granted to it. And all these properties are enforced and executed by a virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor is the system that creates a virtual environment for these programs to run in. Sitting here today, these definitions seem pretty ordinary, but back in 1974, it was a big step forward to have these clearly articulated definitions. Now that we've defined what a virtual machine is, we now come to defining some of the properties of the underlying processors. We assume that processors have linear and uniformly addressable memory. We also assume that the processor has two modes of operation, a supervisor mode and a user mode. The difference between the two is that the supervisor mode can execute the entire instruction set, whereas user mode can only execute a defined subset of the entire instruction set. We have something called a relocation register, which is the base from which all memory addressing is done. And to formalize this, we define the state of a machine to consist of this four tuple. Executable storage E, which contains the program you're executing. The mode M, whether it's supervisor mode or user mode. A program counter P, which indexes the instruction that you're executing and the relocation bounds register R. This relocation bounds register is important because it's essentially a very basic memory bounds checker. 
it tells you the base address L off of which all memory addresses are constructed and the bound B which tells you the total size of memory allocated to this machine. This is important because it controls memory protection for the virtual machine. If you try to access memory that is outside these bounds, that triggers a memory trap. This combination of the mode, the program counter, and the relocation counter is referred to as the program status word. This is important because it lets you go back and forth between traps as we'll see in a minute. Now when we construct a virtual machine monitor, it is very important for it to be able to oversee the execution of the program inside the virtual environment and to be able to control the resources that it uses. And the primary mechanism through which it does that is to use traps. As we just saw, if the program tries to access memory outside the bounds that it is allowed to access, the machine trap. And what are the semantics of a trap? When we trap, we save the program status word just before the trap and all other storage is left unchanged. As the authors say over here, intuitively a trap saves the current state of the machine and passes control to somewhere else, which usually is the virtual machine monitor. Next, we come to some definitions related to instruction behavior. The first definition is for what it means for an instruction to be privileged. An instruction is privileged if and only if it traps in a way that is not a memory trap. Essentially, the way it's defined, a privileged instruction is one whose execution trap. Next, we have to define a class of sensitive instruction. And this is important because it's going to have an implication on whether an instruction set is virtualizable or not. The first definition we look at is that of being control sensitive. And essentially, an instruction is control sensitive if either it tries to change the amount of memory resources or it tries to affect the processor mode. Another type of sensitive instruction is a behavior sensitive instruction. And this means that the execution of that instruction depends on the actual value of the relocation bound register. In other words, the execution of that instruction depends on the actual, not the relative location of some memory address. An example of such an instruction could be one that loads an absolute physical address without going through some sort of memory redirection. So now we have these two kinds of sensitive instructions, control sensitive or behavior sensitive. If an instruction is not sensitive, it is innocuous. Now let's look at the very high level architecture of a virtual machine monitor. This is the piece of software that actually constructs a virtual environment and makes sure that it is properly isolated. One of the key parts of VMM is the allocator. The allocator is the part of the VMM that allocates memory to virtual machines and sets the relocation bounds registers properly so that virtual machines don't overstep their boundaries. Another big part of a VMM is a software interpreter for the small number of privileged instructions that are not directly being executed on the actual hardware. And now that we've built up all these definitions, we can finally state the central theorem of this paper, which says that for a conventional computer, you can construct a virtual machine monitor for it if the set of sensitive instructions is a subset of the set of privileged instructions. Remember from our definitions that privileged instructions are those that trap by definition and sensitive instructions fall into two categories. They are either control sensitive or behavior sensitive. Control sensitive meaning it tries to change the amount of memory accessible to it 
whereas behavior sensitive instructions depended on things like real absolute physical addresses as opposed to relative physical addresses at an intuitive level this makes sense because this means that all sensitive instructions will necessarily trap into the virtual machine monitor and this gives the virtual machine monitor complete control over enforcing the right isolation properties thinking of it and on the way if you had a sensitive instruction that did not trap in other words that was not privileged it would be possible to break some of the virtual machine properties now the authors go over a formal proof of this theorem in the paper which is too long to cover for a short video but i'd encourage you to look at it if you're interested in the details and this is not an entirely theoretical exercise because up until very recently even when the early versions of VMware for the x86 architecture came out the x86 architecture was not fully virtualizable and the early versions of VMware actually had to dynamically rewrite some instructions in software in order to provide full virtualization this was fixed in later versions of the x86 architecture to allow complete hardware virtualization so that was a quick look at a very early seminal paper that defines what it means for an instruction set to be virtualizable what a virtual machine is and tops it off with a theorem for the necessary condition that an instruction set architecture must have to be virtualizable i hope you enjoyed that and i will see you next time thank you very much